Hey guys, just a very quick update here. I want to talk about a few things. At the crime scene that morning, Canton police picked up blood drops. They put them in those little uh, red party cups and uh, plucked them out of the snow and brought them back as evidence. Question I had about that that no one's asking that it just it just occurred to me today is why do that? Is it normal to pick up blood evidence at an accident scene, for instance, say at a hit and run accident scene, you know, where you presume that somebody hit the guy and he's injured and that you're going to go around and collect blood samples? I, I don't I don't think that's normal, but I have a theory on that, so let's come back to it. Uh, another thing I have a question on is the baseball hat. John O'Keefe was wearing a baseball hat. We see that in all the uh, reports. He was on the video with that. So either that hat would have been found in Karen's car if he took it off before he went into the house. But more than likely, since he wore it into the bar, he also wore it into the house. So is that with the clothing? Uh, you know, you get in a fight, pretty good, ch especially a violent fight like that. There's a pretty good chance, I'd say more than a good chance, that that hat's going to get knocked off in the fight. If he staggers outside, does he have the hat with him? If he's carried outside, do they put the hat back on his head? Do they walk it out and throw it on top of his body? You know, where was that hat found? Or, conversely, if he is struck by Karen's SUV, what happens to the hat? You know, he, he somehow he ended up 12 feet on the lawn. I don't even know what the prosecution's theory is on that. There was no tire tracks on the lawn. So is the theory that he got banged somehow in the back of the head, like he had crouched down to pick up broken glass maybe or something, and I don't know, somehow weirdly got struck by her taillight in the back of the head, and then he still had enough life in him to stagger up onto the lawn? I mean, I'm not really sure what the theory is there on that. Uh, also, it's really interesting what Turtle Boy has discovered about the tow truck in Dighton. So just to remind people uh, who aren't familiar, Karen Reed, after the accident, she, well, not after the accident, after the police had taken John to the hospital, she drove to her parents' house in Dighton, which is, I think, maybe a half hour away or an hour away from, from the accident scene, uh, where she was there, obviously distraught and trying to recover and being consoled by her parents. That's when Officer State Trooper Proctor showed up there According to his report, he arrived at 4.30 and had the, uh, the tr that's, and he, that's when he found that the taillight was broken and he towed the car back to Canton at 5.30. But Turtle Boy has discovered that at 2.30, he was actually on scene because he called the Dighton Police Department and tried to get them to tow the car. So that was at 2.30. So we don't know for sure what time he arrived, but it definitely was before 2.30. So, you know, to me, if this, in his report, if he's off by, I and mean, already, the, you know, the, the prosecutor's already addressed this, uh, as Turtle Boy calls him, Lunchbox Slally. You know, he's tried to explain this to say there was a, a, a question of um, no adjustment for daylight savings on his phone or something like that. I mean, if, you know, in theory, there could be, all kinds of reasons to explain Proctor being off by an hour. You know, you're writing these lengthy reports related to an accident, and you're not thinking that that's going to be important, so maybe you're off by an hour. In theory. it's I mean, it's, it's sloppy, but in theory. But I don't know, it's really hard for me to understand how he could write that he arrived at 4.30 and told it at 5.30 when he actually arrived at least well before 2.30 and first called for a tow at 2.30, and then it was actually... The tow truck actually showed up and took it away at 412. I, that's, that's really strange to me. Then another big thing that's happened this week, and I know, you know, is it related to this case? I mean, when odd things happen all at the same time, you don't want to be a conspiracy theorist, but you have to wonder what possible connections are. So U.S. Attorney Rachel Rollins was fired by DOJ this week after an internal affairs investigation that found her guilty of a bunch of ethics violations. Uh, I don't know if she was guilty. She's not been charged with any crimes, but she was guilty of ethics violations. So it's kind of a strange thing because Rachel R Rollins is one of those far-left progressive prosecutors that was first pushed by uh, George Soros. And because I'm um, based on that, he became elected to DA. I forget which, uh, maybe Suffolk County or I'm not sure. I think Suffolk County, which is Boston. And not long after, now she was controversial. So controversial to the point that even the Boston, the very liberal Boston Globe has reported a whole bunch of stuff on her. I mean, she's clearly kind of crazy and not very qualified for the job, but she gets promoted for kind of obvious reasons, for political reasons. And so the and so one of the first things that the Biden administration did was to decide to give her a promotion by appointing her as the U.S. attorney for Boston. That's a very powerful position. And despite the fact that the Globe was publishing these articles while she was in that nomination process, they didn't withdraw it. So they went forward 
Now, she's only been the, uh, the U.S. attorney in Boston for 16 months, and now she's already been fired. And what was she fired for? She was fired for a bunch of little petty things. They were serious things, but at the same time, kind of petty. What I mean by serious is, you know, it's clear that she didn't think the law or the rules or ethics apply to her. And she's not a politician. She's the U.S. attorney. So she's one of the top law enforcement officials in the country. And if the laws don't apply to her, that's really trouble. So, yeah, people like that should not be in those positions. I also found it really strange that she was fired. And when I looked at the specifics of what she was fired for, you know, she politicized her office. Um, she violated the hats rule by showing up with Jill Biden at a fundraiser in Andover. Um, she took gifts to fly her out to some uh, other political rally out in California. She was a highly politicized per She interfered with the election for her replacement as DA in Boston. She's a person that politicizes her office. She's corrupt. She's abusive. She doesn't think the rules apply to her. But here's the thing. Most of the people, if not all of the people that work for Biden's Department of Justice are like that. I'm not trying to be political here. I really don't want to bring politics onto the site. I'm not a Trumpster. Uh, you know, I try to be try to be down the middle as much as possible. But we've seen certainly since the Obama years and then really badly over the last two years and even during the Trump years, but by holdovers from the Obama administration, to what degree these federal officials have politicized and corrupted their office. I mean, if you look at the John Durham report that just came out, I, I know we, if you happen to only watch CNN or read the New York Times, it was underscored, but it's really in, compared in a lot of ways to Watergate. It's that bad. And there's no fix for it because you can't change the rules when the problem is, is these people don't think the rules apply to them. They don't follow them. And that's really a consistent problem. Oh, hi, Harry. This is, I don't, you probably can't see this is Harry. Harry is an Italian Spanoni. Um, Harry, let's say, can I... Harry, look, you know, dogs are not very good at looking at cameras. Neither, neither am I. Um, anyway, sorry about that little. Ha oh, I gotta let that's that's George too. Two Italians, but only George is now going out. So back to Rachel Rollins. So I when I look and I see her getting fired for what everybody else has is does in the Department of Justice. Now maybe they've discovered something even more serious that they're afraid to kind of tell, and they're just using this as what they have to fire. But you know, I without being conspiracy theory guy, I can't help thinking. Or at least wondering, there might be some other reason why they needed to get her out of the way. And you got to understand now, Rawls is, is a Democrat. She's was big time supported by Senator Elizabeth Warren. Uh, so it's not like these are Republicans firing her. This, these are this is a very partisan Democrat administration firing a very partisan U.S. attorney. Is there something going on? And I couldn't help wondering: Is it possible that some of the investigations that she is in the middle of right now? Without her even knowing it, knowing it, she might actually be about to stumble on something that they don't want her to stumble on. And they're trying to shut down these investigations. You know, what two other big things are going on now? Well, one thing is the Karen Reed case. Obviously, there are rumors, and I've heard them from my sources too in law enforcement. But again, I really can't say that they're anything but rumors because there are rumors that sweep, that sweep through police circles too. So you, you just don't know. Uh, obviously, Turtle Boy has good sources to it. He's saying the same thing, that there is an FBI investigation and that there is uh, a grand jury seat, which would be Rachel Rollins' office. But I, I, you know, I can't confirm that. I don't, and I don't, in my own mind, I'm like 50 50 on it. I've actually, maybe even less because I don't know what is there to predicate a federal investigation at this point. I didn't see any evidence of anything like that at the hearing a couple weeks ago on, on McCabe. Uh, not on McCabe, on uh, Karen Reed. If there is a federal, if there is a grand jury going on right now, what they'd be investigating would be corruption related to the state police. Is it possible that there's something involved in that state police corruption that the feds are really worried about that they don't want? Rollins to accidentally stumble into something highly politically sensitive. Uh, I, you know, I don't know. You get into speculation. But there's another huge case going on right now, way bigger than all of this potentially. And it's, again, this is under Rachel Rollins' office. And that is the leak of, um, I forget his name, uh, the leak of classified documents. I think his name was Jack Teixeira who was a young National Guardsman who uh, was arrested, I think, a month ago now for leaking highly classified and sensitive documents, particularly about the Iraq war, but about other things. And so that's going on right now under Rachel Rollins' office. So you get that going on, and you got possibly the investigation of the investigators of Karen Reed, and you help, and then all of a sudden Rollins gets fired in the middle of all this. It's really weird. I'll just leave it at that, but it's really weird, and keep your eye out for it. Just a couple more things and I'll finish up. McCabe's phone. 
This to me is like, if I'm going to make a decision on where I lean towards whether Reed is guilty or whether there's a massive conspiracy going up, at this point, a lot of it hinges on McCabe's phone. If she actually did, Google at 2.27 a.m., how long to die in the cold? I mean, there's no innocent explanation for that. You have to be, I mean, obviously, maybe proving that beyond a reasonable doubt is one thing, but for any common sense person, if she's Googling that, there's no other reason that she, except that it would be too much of a coincidence, the idea that she would be Googling that while a cop who was at the party she just left happened to be dying of hypothermia on the lawn. I mean, there's just that coincidence is beyond, you know, anything, anything that's, it's, that's even possible without her at least having some suspicion that he was out there in grave danger. So the question is, the prosecution says that the defense interpretation of that data is incorrect that she did not make that search at 2.27 a.m. So at this point, it's like a he said, she said between the defense and the prosecution. And we don't know where to stand, right? But an interesting thing, though, is that it comes down to, for me, what would make me lean towards the fact that the defense is correct on this is the fact that it's reported. The prosecution did never gave Reed's defense the actual forensic data from McCabe's phone. Instead, they gave a report that was written by State Trooper Michael Proctor. To me, that seems very unusual and suspicious. But this is where I wish. I actually have um, a couple of, two of my close friends and college roommates work for the system. Uh, one of them is an assistant prosecutor, and the other one is actually a judge in a criminal court. And I don't usually bother them with, bother them with these kind of questions, but I'd really like to know. So you have the Brady Rule. The Brady Rule is where the prosecution has to supply the defense with anything that that might be uh, exculpatory. Any exculp any evidence they have, they have to hand it over, pretty much, uh, because it, it, if anything, it might possibly prove or help the case of the of the accused. So, in this, what I wonder here is: is that normal or unnormal? Is that, is that very unusual? That instead of giving them the raw data, they just gave them a report. I mean, it strikes me as very unusual. But I really need to talk to someone who's a, you know a prosecutor or a former prosecutor or someone who works in that field to say, yeah, well, it's you know it's 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 not ideal, but they do it all the time. You know, I, I don't know. Maybe that maybe that's the case because if it's not, it's highly suspicious. And they seem to um, strangely, if 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 what if what's being reported is correct, and I credit Turtle Boy for a lot of these reports. Um, it seems that. The only reason the DA finally did turn over this forensic data from Jennifer McCabe's phone is that the judge ordered it. So I mean, I, the, the, the possible innocent explanation is is that the DA was protecting private data of Jennifer McCabe, and so so in order to protect her. So for instance, let's say she had some compromising personal message on it that has nothing to do with the case. Uh, they, they're trying to protect her so that the defense doesn't see that. And so that, therefore, they go with the state trooper just doing a report. I'm, I'm not sure what, what the actual rule is on this. I mean, obviously, it seems like you'd want to give people the raw data, but it, it also seems like there's a legitimate reason why maybe you would. And so finally, let me go back to the blood drops. Yep. Do, pol do police at an accident scene, say, have a hit and run, do they normally collect blood drop data? I don't know, but it seems to me the answer is no. So why would they pick up blood drops at the crime scene of O'Keefe's death. And the only reason that I can think of is that at the time when they looked at John O'Keefe, they thought they were looking at someone who had been in a fight. And therefore, they wanted that blood because they thought it might, might be someone else's. Okay, thanks guys. Um, this was a very quick and sloppy update. Sorry about that. I appreciate having you with me. Um, please click, click subscribe, click notify, take this video and post a link on your Twitter feed or on your Facebook and say, I'm with Team Yellow Cottage Tales and please support these people. They need, they need all your help. <laughs> okay. Thanks guys. I love you.